This is a hormone testing tutorial. We're going to discuss vaginal hormone application and what you should expect from laboratory values following vaginal or labial application. We will also talk a little bit about using um, hormone application on the rectal mucosa, which is uh, somewhat popular for some physicians in terms of male application of hormones especially, uh, but they should be fairly analogous. So with a mucosal membrane, the first point I think to make is simply that this is not the same as using a hormone cream and putting it on the skin. When you put hormones on the skin in a cream, you get a situation where the values do not increase intuitively. You get much higher increases in terms of your saliva uh, values as opposed to in serum. So this is different. So with serum, really the challenge for mucosal membrane route of administration is just timing of just knowing when that value is going to be at the place you want it to test it. And the same issue is going to exist with saliva uh, in that, you know, we really need to see where the peak and where the valley is in a particular situation. And we'll show uh, show some data to, to help out with the timing issue there. But with saliva, we've got this compounding variable in that, you know, you really want to look into whether or not you're going to get super physiological values with saliva or not. So... I've definitely seen firsthand issues of hormones being applied to mucosal membranes and not seeing super physiological values, but I have seen situations where the values go up, uh, let's say, tenfold above you know, a young, healthy level, but only briefly and then back down. So that would be an issue that would need to be really resolved um, I think, to, to comfortably use saliva. But you're still going to have this timing issue of how do you know when to test. And that's really where urine testing can be helpful to say, okay, if we have a peak and a valley, we can just collect the sample over that whole time and we can test it. But if you're measuring a hormone that you're giving in an area from where the sample's coming from, right? So you put a hormone in the vaginal area, and that's, of course, where your urine's coming from. It's very, very easy to have a contamination. So what we've done is come up with a separate method that tries to take care of both of these issues, and we'll show you uh, how that works because it's made specifically for effectively monitoring the vaginal application of hormones. So with the timing, if we're looking at testosterone values over time, after the application of vaginal testosterone, uh, this is what they got in one study where you can see here are the placebos, meaning just here's what these women look like when they're not on testosterone. And then you can see these two individuals. So uh, person number one looks ideal for testing because it's you know up pretty gradually, but then it stays high for several hours and then drops back down, whereas person number two has more of this quick peak and then it's back down to baseline by eight hours. So that really makes it challenging in that if you if you gave this person a, a vaginal hormone, let's say at night, and tested them in the morning, you know one of the people would be back at baseline, the other one would not. Uh, if you gave it in the morning, then it's a matter of when you test and knowing when that is becomes rather challenging. And in this case, we only have one variable, and that's person A to person B, so the inter-individual variance can be significant enough to make it challenging. But then you also have additional variables. What happens when you use a different hormone? So here are some progesterone values from a study. You can see they behave a little bit differently, so the peak's probably somewhere around maybe 12 hours, uh, which is much later than what we just showed, and then at 24 hours, the values are still pretty elevated there. Uh, so that's different. And that might be because it's progesterone. It might be because it's in you know a different type of cream that they're using. Because with the delivery, you know you can use a small amount of a very very highly concentrated uh, substance, or you could give the same amount of hormone but with a much larger application in terms of the cream. So a lower concentration, higher volume of the cream, and those are going to act differently. If the base itself is different, that also is going to affect how quickly those values go up and down. And then, of course, you have timing issues. If Again, in one situation, you put it on at night and you lay down flat all night. And then in another situation, you're using the same product, but you're up all day and you're active after a morning application, then you, you shouldn't expect the same results. And it's really tough to predict when to test. So ideally, you'd collect over the whole time period, which makes a 24-hour urine a pretty good idea but again, you're going to contaminate the sample for testosterone and estrogens. But there's a solution to this. So what are we measuring in urine? We're not actually measuring 
free testosterone. If this represents free testosterone, it's not water soluble. There's hardly any in urine. What we're measuring are the phase two conjugates. So sulfates and glucuronides. So a glucuronide is essentially a sugar molecule. It's attached to the hydroxy group on the molecule and that's what you find in urine. So in a urine sample, if it's not contaminated, you have almost entirely conjugates, 98%, 99%. So the free hormone is not a significant measurement. And then when you introduce hormones by way of contamination, now you've got an unknown addition to this. Now what are you going to do about that? What we've done is come up with a method to eliminate and remove all of the free hormone. And it, it hasn't changed that original value significantly, so we're still getting a meaningful value without fear of contamination. And that's what we're measuring, which is, uh, I think, a, a better value. Now, for progesterone, this is not an issue. So urine testing works great for progesterone because you don't measure it directly. Progesterone itself doesn't have a hydroxy group. So it can't be conjugated. You can't add a sulfate. You can't add a glucuronide. So there's really none in urine. And researchers have always measured it in urine indirectly by beta pregnane diol, which tracks very well with progesterone. But we know half the progesterone goes down this pathway, the alpha pathway. So we measure both the alpha and the beta pregnane diol. And then this value represents just the average of the two. And that's a real good value to see what's going on in a situation like this where we're taking vaginal progesterone uh, and you can see a nice luteal type response to the progesterone there and then we want to move on to the other hormones and this is where removing the contamination becomes key so this patient's taking testosterone and also by estrogen so you can see by estrogen they'd be taking e2 and e3 and you can see that this is a four to one situation where they're taking a lot more estriol which is why it's elevated, than estradiol. Now with estradiol, note that the postmenopausal range is 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. So most postmenopausal women are around 0.5. So she's elevated above baseline. So this supplement has, has elevated her systemic levels of hormones, not quite to the premenopausal range, but that's the intent here, is to give more estriol than estradiol. And what you'd find in a situation like this is that estradiol would be much higher than estrone if there's a contamination because you're adding extra estradiol. As it is, this estradiol is free of that contamination. This estradiol has been in systemic circulation. It's interconverted with estrone, both of which have been conjugated, and that's what we're measuring here. So you can see both values are, are they're outside the postmenopausal range, but a little bit short of the premenopausal range, and that's effective monitoring of these hormones. So for testosterone, we've got a lot of metabolites we can measure as well, but when we look at testosterone itself, you can see she's in the lower part of normal. Now when I look at that, I think, well, you know, are we above baseline there, or is that just her baseline value? And obviously if you have an initial test, that will help with that. Another thing that can help with that is just glancing at the epitestosterone. This is not true to any absolute degree, but typically epitestosterone which is not androgenic. This is not for evaluating hormone status. It's just they usually end up right around the same concentration level. And so if you look and testosterone is elevated above the epitestosterone, then that indicates supplementation. So for doping for Olympics, when this ratio is higher than, let's say, 4 to 1 testosterone, epitestosterone, that's what they say. It indicates supplementation. So... Um, in this case, it indicates some supplementation, and that is a pretty low dose that they use, so this makes a lot of sense. It looks like her testosterone's gone probably from a low value to a low normal value, uh, and so that's, again, effective monitoring without contamination. Now, here's a second person where the patient's taking by estrogen, but not a 4 to 1, a 1 to 1. And so they're actually getting a little bit heftier dose of estradiol, and you can see the estrone here right down the middle, the estriol of which they're taking some is also right down the middle. And then the nice thing about this test is we can look at the metabolites. We're not going to get into that too much here, but you can see that estrone is normal, estradiol is high, and estriol is normal. So we'd expect to see at least normal levels of these metabolites as well if it's appropriately metabolized. And you can see that the so-called good estrogen metabolite, the 2-hydroxyestrone, 
is below range. So this patient is not pushing their estrogen down that 2-hydroxy pathway the way you'd like to see. So you might think of concurrently giving a patient like this DIM or indole-3-carbinol to help that along. Now let's talk just briefly about male testosterone applied to the rectal mucosa. Why do people use this? Because there's so much confusion with transdermal hormones, both in the labs and with the clinical effect. But when you put it on a mucosal membrane, you tend to get a very nice increase. So again here, I want to glance at epitestosterone is below range at around 7 or 8. Now again, the reference ranges for testosterone and epitestosterone are almost identical. And then with testosterone, up around 40. So that implies that the difference here it implies supplementation. The, the testosterone is well above what the baseline levels would be. So then as we look at the metabolism, you can see here's the testosterone, well within the normal range. And then we can look at a couple different things for metabolism. One, we want to know how much is getting pushed towards the more potent DHT. So beta DHT is not androgenic. Alpha DHT is the most androgenic hormone and you know may have an issue in terms of elevated levels being linked to prostate cancer risk. So we want to look at this a little bit and you can see that if we look at the metabolites, which is the best way to, to monitor this, you can see that the alpha pathway is heavily represented, whereas the beta pathway is not at all represented uh, to the same degree. So this patient, when you give them testosterone, is pushing a lot of it towards DHT. So that's something to think about for thinning scalp hair, for prostate issues. If this was a, ma a female patient, um, you know, if they were having symptoms of excess androgen, it could be also due to that, not just too much testosterone. So the other place they can push the testosterone, of course, is to estrogen. And you can see that if we look at the estrogens, the primary estrogens are very elevated. So that's concerning. And then we want to know, you know, in a lot of cases you'll see that the estrogen's high and you might think, well, we need to block aromatase. And that may be the case. But also with this patient, notice that just like the female we just showed, they're not pushing it very well down the 2-hydroxy pathway. And so you could actually attack this from both sides by blocking aromatase if you like. But also these estrone values will go down and estradiol values go down typically by about half if you put someone on methane or indole-3-carbonyl. So a patient like this would have a twofold benefit. One, their metabolism picture gets a lot more beneficial in that their 2-hydroxy uh, becomes more predominant and also those parent estrogens of E1 and E2 are going to come down. So in summary, Timing is really the main issue with serum and saliva testing. It makes it difficult, not impossible, especially with, uh, with serum testing. You know, you're going to get reasonable values out of a lot of these. It's just really difficult to know when. And then you also don't have all this rich metabolism information, which is nice to get from urine, but it's, it's typically contaminated if you're using that type of a sample. So our testing was really made to address both of these issues, and we built the test very specifically to be effective for monitoring vaginal hormones. Uh, we should also say that we are not free, as a caveat, from the timing issues. So if you're looking at a situation, as we showed before, vaginal hormones. Now, what we measure in urine is a conjugate, so it's going to be delayed. So typically, you know, your conjugates are a little bit slower. So if we're looking at this person, you know, you may look more like this in urine testing. And you need to take that into consideration in that if you're an entire day out from your previous supplement, you may not see that. Um, and so you need to take into consideration the timing. And we, what we have patients do is just stay on their supplement as they would normally take it. If you take it at night, this is not a problem. If you take it very, very early in the morning, some of that may pass uh, before that first dinner time collection um, as you collect your sample. So that's something to think about. In some cases, you may want to have them uh, put it on a little bit later in the day to make sure you catch that. But typically, what we're finding is a, good, is a real good value, again, because there's a little bit of a delay with the urine uh, and that it has been working very effectively for a lot of physicians. So if you have any questions or you'd like to con uh, contribute to this conversation, feel free to reach out via email. Um, or you can go to our website and contact us that way. And thank you for your attention.